Hi there, Steve Arterburn here, and thanks for joining me for Facebook Live. I hope that you are uh, watching our live program, 1 o'clock Eastern Time. You could uh, get it on Facebook. Uh, you could get it on our website, newlife.com. Uh, you could go to Sirius XM, 1 o'clock, uh, channel 131. That's uh, 1 o'clock Eastern, uh, 10 Pacific Time. So I hope that you'll tune in there. It's an hour of live call-in where people can really get some great help from the therapists that I work with. Also, I hope that uh, something that we're doing here uh, is helpful to you. Uh, you know, we've, we really are, are trying to do things that are relevant, and if, if they're not relevant, then I don't want to be doing them. So, um, you know, we're talking about uh, all of this stress and pressure that builds up, and in no place does that seem to be greater than in the, the situation where there's a remarriage and especially where there are kids. So I want to focus on uh, the remarriage issue today, and I might have some challenging things to say to you, uh, but don't give up until I finish. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that not everybody is really free to remarry. The Bible gives us a couple of criteria that says in these situations you're free to divorce. And so if we're free to divorce, then we are free to remarry. Some people don't interpret it that way, but um, the Bible scholars that I work with, and I've worked on yeah, over 12 Bibles so far, that if you're free uh, from this original marriage because the person was unfaithful or they have proven to be a non-believer and they've abandoned you, uh, then you're going to be free. You're not held to that. You're free to remarry. Some of you didn't marry uh, with those in the background of the remarriage. And so some people would say, well, then you need to divorce and go remarry the person you were married to. No, uh, you're married. And creating another divorce, and especially if there are kids, and traumatizing the kids, that's not going to be uh, the answer. That's not good. We don't, we don't want to encourage that for anybody. So what do you do? You humble yourself before God. You confess that it wasn't right for you to uh, divorce, remarry. You try to make restitution for that. You make amends for that. And then you pick up your life and you live in God's grace. The Bible says that God is rich in mercy. And so that mercy is there for you if you have remarried. You know, God hates divorce, but He doesn't hate the people that get divorced. And a lot of times we hear people talking about divorce, and it seems like that they're saying God hates the people that get divorced. God is love, and He loves people that get a divorce and wants them to have the best chance possible. Now, I am divorced. My previous wife left after uh, and divorced me after she had been unfaithful, which she had left a long time before that. And so uh, what I'm talking about is not something that I read out of a textbook. A lot of this I've experienced myself. So I want to talk about this remarriage issue and, you know, it's never too late to redo. For instance, one of the first things that I'm going to say is this, that we need to do the one thing that every dog needs to master. Doesn't that sound horrible to start like that? But it's true. What does a dog need to learn how to do? Heal. But our healing is H-E-L. And I wrote a book. My wife and I actually wrote this together after we were married. And it's called Healing is a Choice. And there are 10 different choices that we make to bring about healing in our lives. Now, you have to want healing to bring about healing. And I can't promise physical healing. And in some cases, I can't promise all emotional healing. But I'm saying you do these 10 things and it increases the potential for you to heal every one of these choices. It comes out of the uh, the book of John where Jesus walked up to a man who'd been sick for 32 years and asked him, do you want to be healed? Sounds like a ridiculous question. He was beside a healing pool where people went to be healed. But see, I think Jesus had to ask this guy because some people 
They look like they want to be healed. They act like it. They don't want to be healed. They want to stay in this state of learned helplessness. I don't want you to be there. I want you to heal. And, you know, if you're going to heal, you have to stop. You have to stop what you're doing, and you have to begin the healing process. Quickly dating after a breakup of a marriage leads to sickly dating. And so what we end up doing is repeating the exact same thing. We say, I'll never marry somebody like that. No, we're, we don't marry anybody like that. And that's our standard. I'll never marry anybody like this. So I don't. I marry somebody a little bit better. But you step back, they look like they're identical. Here's the standard, not the person you just were married to, didn't work out. If you're focusing on not marrying this, you're not seeing what this is. That makes sense? Should. You know, um, it's important that we have a standard that is God's standard and that we're doing whatever it takes to live up to it. And the first thing is to heal. Now, when, before we got married, we both had therapists. We exchanged therapists. I went to her. She went to mine. We needed uh, an endorsement. We had truth tellers. We had people, John Townsend uh, said to my, mo my wife, uh, mom, I think he found an angel. My wife stayed in a cabin on a cruise with my uh, mother, a New Life cruise, before we were married. Her conclusion, I think everybody ought to be married to somebody like this. So we had endorsements. We had therapists on our team. And we got married, and guess what? We still had problems. We still had problems. I mean, the legs, you could say, or the wheels fell off of the marriage uh, in the first year. It was a, a really tough, tough time. And we had good counsel. The, the people that do our uh, marriage intensive, Mylon and Kay Yurkovich, worked with us from the very, very beginning. I had all these wise people around me. I did all this stuff, and we still had problems. We still go to marriage counseling today, and we're having the best years of our marriage in these later years. We've been married over 15 years. But because we're still working and still not assuming anything ought to work, we're having the best time ever. But we, and I say often, Mylon and Kay made our marriage work. Well, they made it work, but they also made it work. And if you're not working on the marriage, then you're probably not doing all that you need to do and can do to make it successful. Second thing I want to say, dating in a state of desperation tends to attract desperate and predatorial people. There are folks that want to be a hero to a desperate person. Or there's somebody who wants to control somebody that's desperate. When I met Misty, she was working she had uh, bought a house after she was divorced. She didn't need a paycheck. She wasn't desperate. Uh, when I went to see her finally, and you know, uh, we emailed each other for uh, months before I ever even talked to her on the phone. Then I talked to her on the phone for months, and then finally we had a date. When I finally went to Indianapolis, and I saw this darling house that she owned, and the, the way she was uh, she'd already read the Chronicles of Narnia to her five- and six-year-old boys. They had already been through the entire Discovery Bible. And I was so amazed and impressed with the way she was mothering them and managing her money and her life. She was not desperate. If anybody was desperate, it was me. I was so hurt and broken. And, um, you know, John and Henry, they said, you know, you've been treated so poorly in the past. We're afraid that the first person that's nice to you, you're going to want to marry them. And so they made me commit that I would date 20 people before I determined this is the person that I'm going to uh, be married to. Well, Misty was number three. I fulfilled that commitment, although uh, some of them, um, well, I had to say, you know, it was like I met somebody in the line at Starbucks. Um, and after I had met uh, Misty, they really didn't have much of a chance because she was so unique. First of all, I met her, I heard her laughing uh, in another area at a New Life conference, and I had to go see who this person was that was laughing. It was such a beautiful laughter. And then she was so beautiful. Well, I've been around a lot of beautiful people. If she had just been beautiful, it, it would have been, uh, you know, a date or something. But 
she she had something underneath it that was this brilliant IQ, this wisdom. She'd been in recovery, been in Al-Anon uh, from the things in her first marriage. And so there was respect there. And then I needed time. And I was doing counseling with Mylan because I was not in the best place. Well, once I met her, I, we didn't date. In fact, uh, we didn't even uh, have contact with each other for about a year. And then she finally uh, read a book of mine that had my email address in it. And she read the story about Madeline and the bike accident that I wrote. And she emailed me and said, man, that was a great story. She said, you probably don't remember me. Well, I did remember her. And that's began our emailing that led to the phone calls, that led to a date, that led to us getting married. Now, you need premarital preparation. So you heal, and then you, you get out of the state of desperation, and then you get premarital preparation. Therapy for both people that are going to be married. Must have it. Some people say, really? Yes, must. Divorce recovery. Both of you should go through the divorce recovery program. I went through the one that Saddleback offered. Very helpful to me. If there's any uh, addiction, you need to be in recovery. If you were married to one, you need to be in codependency recovery, Al-Anon or something like that. Premarital counseling, you have to get it. And if you have children, the k children need to be in counseling and you need to learn the art of repairing a relationship. That's one of the things we teach in our marriage intensive. So then, number four, you need to healthily blend and integrate the children into the relationship. Hopefully you're not doing it too soon. You're not meeting the children too soon. What a disaster. You have to deal with all the resentment, the bitterness uh, that is there with these children. They have expectations. They're going to see you as the person that, that caused mom and dad not to reconcile. doesn't matter how long you wait. Uh, you have to listen to them. You have to hear them. You have to understand their concerns. And, um, and you have to consider the impact that this marriage is going to have on them and how that's going to impact you. And so you might decide we're not going to marry right now because of that impact or we're not ever going to marry or maybe it's the near future we're going to marry. But every decision has to take into consideration those children, if there are children involved. Now, you see marriage as a celebration. Many times the kids see it as a hostile takeover. Well, you have to plan. And you have to see that, that somebody is not going to be happy sharing a bedroom when they had one where they were separate, moving when they loved where they lived. All sorts of things you have to deal with and talk through. That's why we've got to go slow. And you can't address all these things if you don't go very, very slowly in the dating process. Then you have to be ready that once you're married, there's going to be a post-marriage idealized dream disintegration. Anybody that had high hopes, they're going to be dashed. Once you eat the wedding cake, a lot of things change for a lot of people. And so you have to be ready for that. You have to say, once we get married, it's not going to be all bliss. These kids aren't going to be thrilled. We have to be ready for it and meet it head on. And then once we are married, we have to implement the repair skills that we have learned before we got married. We need to ask for do-overs. We need to say, I sense that you're hurting or something's bothering you. I want uh, to talk to you about whatever that is that's bothering you. We have to do all of that if we're going to make this work. Now, the next time we're together, I'm going to talk to you uh, about the 10 priorities of being a certifiably quality bonus parent. I'll give you 10 things, and I, uh, I hope that that's going to really help you. And uh, until then, if you need some help, 1-800-NEW-LIFE. Ron Deal has some great smart step parenting books in a series. You might want to pick those up. They can give you some additional information. But thanks for joining me. If you need some help, you call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE. And don't forget to tune in to the radio program. 1-800-NEW-LIFE and newlife.com. Thanks for joining me for Facebook Live 
And if you want to be a great bonus parent or you know somebody that needs to be, you tune in tomorrow to Facebook Live. See you then.